Krikor and I have been close friends. We met through BVA. We've controlled a lot together. We've flown a lot on the network together. And uh, we largely progressed through our uh, real-world ratings together. Krikor is a flight instructor with instrument, airplane, and multi-airplane privileges as well. He is currently based out of Nashville and owns a beautiful 1976, I believe, green Mooney that is a lot of fun to fly. He's extremely knowledgeable, extremely professional, and I'm sure he's going to teach you guys today a ton. Cool. Thank you, Alec. Uh, so my name is Craig Gore, and of course I'm talking about Alec. Alec is really what, who, uh, not what, but who got me into BVA in the first place, something like six or seven years ago. So like you said, we've known each other uh, for quite a while. He got me into flight training, helped me progress through my ratings, uh, and he actually trained me for one of them. He, he gave me, oops, he gave me the uh, training for uh, flight instructor instrument. So he lives in Atlanta, Georgia right now, uh, CFI, CFII. Uh, goes to Georgia Tech, which I think speaks a lot about him. And we have something like 150 hours of flying together, which is somewhat terrifying and concerning at the same time. But uh, yeah, I think lots, that more or less of, covers uh, it. Lots of flying stories and banter to be told. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So fair to say we know each other pretty well. I think it's going to be a pretty good dynamic over the next couple of weeks as we continue to teach this ground course together. Uh, yeah. So. Again, I think Rico and I are both pretty similar in the sense that if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to ask them whenever we ask if anybody has any questions. Um, otherwise, if you want to just, if you aren't super comfortable with speaking up, feel free to post them in the chat, either on Google Meet or in TeamSpeak if you're on TeamSpeak, and we'll get to them, uh, well, probably about instantly. Yeah, and if there's anything that you want to ask but you don't want to put anything in the chat or speak up verbally, you can send one of us a private message as well. And we can, uh, at the end of each slide or, or whenever there's a good pause, we can discuss it. Cool. Um, I think that co about covers introductions. We can go ahead and jump right into it if you uh, want to launch, Gregor. All right. So the uh, the first thing we're going to talk about today is the phonetic alphabet. And in fact, in, at first, we're going to talk kind of in general about the different terminology that gets used uh, as it pertains to radio communication. So the phonetic alphabet is the core of aviation communication. It's used in other aspects. The military will use it. Um, marine branches use it, and so do a number of other organizations. Um, but essentially, instead of saying A, B, C on the radio, um, we use specific letters as a, or specific words rather, excuse me, as a code for it. Um, I don't know exactly when they were created, but they're designed so that if there's radio interference or the reception is weak, you're still able to understand what you're trying to say. So here you can see a list of all 26 letters in the English alphabet and their corresponding uh, phonetic uh, identifier. So A is Alpha, B is Bravo, C is Charlie. You can read your way down. They're all pretty straightforward. Um, Quebec is the, the non-correct pronunciation. It's Qua, like K-W is how you're not Quebec. Uh, is how that's supposed to be pronounced. Uh, otherwise, everything is fairly straightforward. On the right side there, you'll see the 10 uh, numbers, 0 through 9. Uh, there are relatively few instances which those numbers are grouped together, so it's important to know how you'd say each individual number. Uh, for the most part, 0, 1, 2, those are all normal, but 3 is pronounced as tree, like a tree with bark and trunk and probably Alec hanging out of one of the branches. Four <laughs> is pronounced four. So there is an emphasis. It's, it's really turned into a two syllable word as opposed to the, the normal one syllable word. Five is fife. Uh, so there is a F that replaces the V. It sounds weird, but it's fife. Six is six. Seven is seven. Eight is eight. Nine is niner with a nine and then an R strapped onto the end there. Um, that's the most common one that you'll hear. Uh, and, and you will hear certain shortcuts of a lot of these in practice on the radio. People will say uh, nine. They won't say niner. You'll hear fox a lot instead of foxtrot, uh, which is F. Uh, but for the most part, you will hear these referenced correctly. And it is uh, most proper to use the phonetic identity. Phonetic uh, identifiers anytime you are referencing something on the radio when you're flying. Here at the BVA Ground School, we do encourage proper pronunciation of the phonetic alphabet. Yes. Unless anyone has any questions, I think that about covers it for this slide.
All right, seeing none, we'll move into radio telephony examples. So, uh, th uh, does, um, I guess we can just go ahead and pronounce how this one is pronounced. We don't really have to do a call and response. So this is uh, a, a normal pretty altitude that you would see. Um, instead of saying 4,500 or 4.5, the pr connect pr uh, phonetic pronunciation is 4,500. And I actually should make a note now that I see this. It should be 4,500, right? Because we're still going to use those phonetic uh, characters that we just talked about. So 4,500, you break up the characters at the, uh, you pronounce everything individually except for the last zeros. Okay, another altitude. Uh, this one is interesting because you can say this as a number. So you wouldn't, it, you wouldn't necessarily say 20,000. Actually, you just straight up would not. It's 20,000. So you can group the thousands together, but the number before the thousands has to go individually. So instead of 20,000, it's two zero thousand. Or um, when referencing an altitude, um, so the, you can say two zero thousand referring to, for example, fuel on board or something like that. Um, when referencing an altitude, however, remember above 18,000, it actually becomes a flight level. So it will be flight level two zero zero. Uh, because in the United States, at 18,000 feet, we transition our altimeters to standard. So everything above that is a flight level. So this is pronounced flight level 200 when referencing it as an altitude. And whenever you're talking about those altitudes, you just say that the, you're going to say flight level to specify that you're using that standard altimeter setting. Uh, and then you're going to reference the altitude in hundreds of feet. So 20,000 feet is, of course, 200 100s. And so that's where we get the 200 from. Good point. All right, now we're going to get into call signs. Um, AAL is the airline prefix. <clears throat> Contrary to how the movies might describe it, you always file and fly with the three letter ICAO prefix. So here would be American. AAL means American Airlines. Their call sign is American. And 1520, you might hear in Europe. Um, them say, uh, pronouncing each number individually in the U.S. That's not quite required. You can shorten that to American 1520. And lastly, uh, general aviation call sign November. That's the phonetic letter for N. November 20556. All right, so CRAFT is an IFR clearance. Uh, that's an acronym that's used as a template for IFR clearances. In other words, every IFR clearance will follow the same path, um, CRAFT. And some items can be removed or amended as necessary, but the general structure will re remain the same. So what does the C actually mean? That's the clearance limit. That is the final point on your flight plan to which you are being clear. That's your destination, so to speak. The R. Um, I will let Creeper take over. Cool. Yeah, so the R is the route portion of the clearance, so that's going to specify if there's any departure. Uh, if you get a reroute, you may receive it in this portion of the clearance, or if you're getting a heading, or if you're just supposed to proceed on course. That's what's going to be specified there. A is the altitude portion, and there's really two components to this. The first is an initial altitude that you're going to climb to immediately after departure, and the second portion is a cruising altitude and how many minutes after departure you can expect that. So you'll hear maintain 5,000, expect flight level 22010 minutes after departure. Uh, that's more of a lost communications thing for IFR procedures. We're not going to get too much into it now, but that's what you will receive in this portion of the clearance. Um, F is the frequency portion. This is a departure frequency. So you're going to call ground, get your taxi clearance, call tower. You'll get a takeoff clearance. Uh, and they're just going to tell you contact departure. And that's the frequency that you're going to get uh, immediately once you are airborne. And they provide that to you um, in the clearance so that you can have it pre-tuned so you're not wasting time in a, a critical phase of flight with a new frequency. And lastly is transponder. Uh, it's a code that you're going to do, a, a four-digit code that you're going to plug into your transponder so that air traffic control is able to see you on their radar and pull all of the bits of information that they need um, to get from you. So here we'll go through a, a, a couple example IFR clearances here. So we have, uh, you know, you could strap any call sign at the beginning. So American 1234 cleared to the Chicago O'Hare Airport. 
via the Albany 6 departure, radar vectors Syracuse, then as filed. Maintain 4000, departure frequency 118.05, squawk 3113. And you can see it's color coded with all of those portions or all of the uh, uh, different parts of the clearance above. The reason that there is only one portion of the altitude clearance is because they're on a departure. Uh, they're on a published departure procedure. Again, that's a little bit more of a specific instrument uh, thing, so we're kind of just going to leave it there. And it's important to note that um, the root portion, if there's nothing wrong with the flight plan, uh, a totally valid and very common way of shortening the entire route is just say then as filed, which means the pilot or the dispatcher filed the flight plan from Syracuse onward, air traffic control and the computers deemed it as correct. So you are perfectly okay to say here, then as filed. That means the aircraft is gonna navigate from uh, via the Albany 6 departure, then to uh, Syracuse and then as filed. Okay, initial contact, here's how we start. Um, you have to initially establish contact with an ATC facility and that'll help maintain the efficiency of the ATC system. Uh, and air traffic control, talking on the radio is a little bit of an art form, I like to call it. You have to provide the right amount of information. If you speak too much, you're wasting time on frequency, you're right, if I was to really speak slowly, that'd be a lot. Um, otherwise, if you're not enough, then you're going to have the controller ask for clarification, which takes up even more time because they have to uh, do another transmission to ask you to clarify. So when you make an initial contact with a con controller, you have to say their position, so who you're calling, then you say who you are, and then you say where you are, such as on the ground or in the air or reference a VOR, and then you tell them what you actually want. So it's who you are, who you're, or who you're calling, who you are, where you are, what you want, as an example. Martha's Vineyard Tower, Cessna 311 Kilo Romeo, five miles south at 2,500 inbound for full stop landing information Bravo. That is a perfectly uh, concise to the point call that delivers all the information needed, no more, no less. Norwood Ground, Mooney 153 Kilo Bravo, information Juliet, south ramp, request taxi, VFR, close traffic. Again, that's an aircraft calling for departure. Boston Approach, November 3901, Quebec, Romeo, 14,000, descending 11,000, information Quebec. Boston Approach, Delta 515 or Delta 515, flight level 187, descending via the Roebuck 3 rival, runway 22 left with uniform. Notice how all of those follow the same format, and it's not too much nor too little. And I'll just add to echo that last one the importance of that descend via call. So for those of you who like to fly jets in VATSIM, one of the most commonly missed done scenarios is that initial check on to a new frequency when you're descending via. So if you've been given a clearance to send via the Roebuck to arrival runway two to left, you read that back, then the controller says contact boss and approach on 118.25. When you check on to that new frequency, communicating just like Alec gave the example is really important. We need to hear your altitude, and we need to hear that you're descending via, and we need to hear the runway that you're descending via for. If you omit one of those pieces of information, we are supposed to come back and say, Delta 515, verify you are in fact descending on the arrival. So by including that in the initial transmission, you've avoided that back and forth, and that helps to alleviate some frequency congestion. Plus, it also makes Jay less angry. <laughs> <laughs> That's always a good sign. And another thing that's important is anytime you check in on a new frequency when you're airborne, you need to say your altitude to that controller so that they can verify if your mode C readout, the, the altitude readout from your transponder is working. Um, if that altitude is not correct, your altimeter is either set wrong or the plane needs to go back into maintenance. <laughs> so there's that as well. Creeker knows all about that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. If nobody has any questions, we can have Creeker talk to us about rebacks. All right. So oh, real quick, uh, question in the Google Meets chat. When is it appropriate to use Cessna or Mooney, et cetera, instead of your full tail number? Uh, Creeker, if you want to tackle this one. Yeah, it, it's it's really not something to overthink. Really, you can use either if you're flying with a, a tail number, right? So November, you know, and then whatever comes after that. Um, you can use either. Uh, air traffic control has different requirements, but for a pilot, from a pilot's perspective, you can say Mooney, Cessna, Skyhawk, uh, or you could just say November if you want. You're really able to do either one. 
Um, you don't need to say both. So you don't need to say like Mooney November six nine or seven four Victor. You could just say Mooney six nine or seven four Victor or November six nine or seven four Victor. Uh, either any of those would work. Hope that answers your question. Any other questions? All right. All right. We'll move roll. on to readbacks. So readbacks are another essential part of the communication process. Uh, that's where you read an instruction back to the controller. Um, and that tells them that you understand what they told you to do and that you will be able to execute it and you will be able to do what they want you to do. Um, a readback it needs to include your call sign, and it serves as a confirmation that you understand and you're accepting the instructions. So, for example, if air traffic control tells you November 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, descend and maintain 5,000, you call back and say, okay, descend and maintain 5,000, November 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, that tells them that you understand, okay, you need to descend and maintain 5,000, and you're reading your, your call sign back so they know that the correct airplane is reading it back, and November 54321 didn't accidentally read that instruction. Uh, readback of runway hold short instructions is particularly important. Uh, it's a requirement from ATC that they get um, a, a full readback of all hold short instructions, including your call sign. If they do not receive that readback, they are going to pester you about it. If you don't believe me, go look on YouTube and you'll probably find a video of me getting yelled at for it somewhere. Um, so that that's that's particularly important. A lot of people will shorten them. So, for example, is short of the right an appropriate runway hold short readback? So, if you know, air traffic control tells you uh, American 2345 hold short runway four right, you respond, uh, okay, we'll hold short of the right, American 2345. Is that a appropriate readback? Anyone want to take a guess? Yeah, you, you would be correct. Um, you need to say the runway and yeah. Yeah. So unless anyone has questions, we'll go on to changing frequencies. Now, this is a. Yeah, go ahead. It's a good practice to say hold short. So, because that's a particularly critical instruction. So, you really want to make sure you're on the same page. So, you should say hold short runway four left or hold short runway one five right. All right, changing frequencies. This is not something you do by. Uh, by yourself, generally speaking, you change frequencies when you are instructed to. And if you don't know or you're unsure, the best thing you can do is ask for clarification. That really goes along for most things, uh, but especially changing frequencies. For example, if you only have one radio or need to change to ATIS or listen to a new frequency, um, either use the second radio or ask for permission. For example, Boston Center, Cessna 48 Lima, request temporary frequency change to listen to the Boston ATIS. And they'll almost always say, yes, no problem, report when you're back. We get that question a lot, too, from pilots who need to step away for a moment. That's a very common request on the network. You need to step away for two or three minutes. We really appreciate when you can make that request on frequency. So the best possible solution is just call up like anything else, just like the example right there. If the frequency is absolutely super busy, hopefully you don't need to step away because chances are we might need to get you. But if it is super busy, sending a text message on the frequency would sort of be a second priority. One thing I really advocate against is pilots using the private message functionality on the network to communicate with ATC about anything flight related. If you send us a private message saying I need to step away, especially when we're busy, it's very hard to see those. They appear in a different spot for us. We have to click into a different screen. And if you're busy and you have a whole bunch of those waiting, they're your last priority as a controller. So if you do need to step away, you need to change frequencies to listen to the ATIS, please make that request on voice. And failing that, send a text through the ATC chat as you would any other radio message. But please don't use the private message to get in touch with us because it does make it very difficult for us to respond and there's a good chance we might miss that. Yeah, Evan raises a very good point. Those are very hard to see if it's a busy controlling session. Sometimes you just wouldn't pay attention to your private messages. All right, as to monitor versus contact, this is a pretty important one. If you are told to contact, you actively, you read that back, you change to the next frequency, and then you check in with your altitude as we previously discussed. For example, American uh, Boston Center, American 425, flight level 200. However, um, 
you make the contact just what I said. As soon as instructed, you check in. When you monitor, that's the same thing as don't call us, we'll call you. For example, Boston Ground might say, American 425, cross runway four left, monitor tower. What that means is you go to that new frequency and you wait for the controller to call you. If you are unclear, ask the previous controller to confirm that you're on the correct frequency if you have been sitting there for a while and you haven't heard anything. Because uh, there might be a system where, uh, for example, flight service, well, that's uh, kind of getting into it. But uh, long story short, when when you're told to monitor, don't call us, we'll call you. And that comes into play quite a lot at Boston. We use that from clearance delivery to push. We use that when we're changing from ground to tower and then between tower frequencies. So during busy events, it is a very common instruction to hear monitor. And it's a real frustration for us as controllers. And we hear it every single event from the people who are actively working the frequencies. You're sitting there with maybe an airplane on final. So nobody can move anywhere. There's no reason for there to be a transmission. And a pilot calls up and says, hey, I'm with you holding short of the runway. And it's like, yes, I know you're there. And there's an airplane on short final. Do you really want to get hit by them? So it would really help us for those who are instructed to monitor the next frequency. As it says there, don't call us, we'll call you. Wait for the controller to reach you. Again, if you've been sitting there for a couple minutes, you look around, there's nobody on final, you can't tell what the reason is, it's perfectly acceptable after a few minutes to query and see what's going on. But again, if it sounds super busy on the frequency, we know you're there and we will move you as quickly as we can. But there is a reason you were asked to monitor and just please be patient. Any questions about any of that? All right. Uh, so some 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 general communication tips, right? Do read back instructions given by ATC. If they tell you to do something and you don't read it back, the controller is not going to know that you understood it, and they're not going to know that you're doing it. So you need to read that back so you can have that mutual understanding. Make appropriate position reports when on CTAF and Unicom. Now, this is a fairly new thing for VATSIM. Uh, since the, the implementation of AFV. Um, but if you're in uncontrolled airspace or there are no controllers online and you're on a Unicom or CTAF frequency, um, make those calls because otherwise an, another airplane may not know that you exist and uh, that generally doesn't work all that well. Uh, make special requests early so ATC can prepare. Uh, if you know that you're gonna need a different runway or you would like to try a, a VOR DME alpha approach during an FNO, the sooner you make that request, the earlier the controllers are able to coordinate it and the more likely it is that that request is gonna be approved. If you wait until you're on a one mile final for runway four right and say, hey, we'd like runway four left, you're probably not gonna get it. Um, so the earlier you make those requests, the, the more likely it is and the easier it is for everybody. Uh, listen to the ATIS and confirm you have the information. Uh, ATISs are there for a reason. They give you weather, they give you runways, approaches, notums. Um, there's a lot of useful information there. So you want to make sure that when you're on your uh, initial descent or before you're getting ready to push, you pick up that ATIS and give the code to the controller because then they don't need to give you all of that information as well. You want to talk about people requesting the VR Alpha approach at Boston during special events like we're in person somewhere in Nashua Creek or? Yeah, that was that was what I was referring to. Yeah. <laughs> That's and a if funny you're a story controller in the room, don't try and get that type of approach approved, or you'll get yelled at by a certain someone. <laughs> oh, the man, point, I though, sat right in front of you guys, and that was entertaining. That was a good time. Yeah. The <laughs> the part of that, uh, I certainly want to underscore the importance of when you know, especially when you're on the ground at Boston, in a busy event probably at least three or four times, if not more, someone will say, hey, what's the departure runway? And when it's busy on the frequency or when you're trying to work out as many IFR clearances as you can, a private message saying, what runway are you departing is really difficult for us to manage. So again, the ATIS is available. You can listen to it on the frequency. You can also actually get the text ATIS through your pilot client as well. So those two solutions are a lot easier for us as controllers to manage than asking the question, hey, what's the active runway? Grab the ATIS and double check. Again, if you're not sure if there's a few runways in there, you know, then it may be appropriate to ask on frequency, but we always recommend that over a private message. Thank you, Evan. A couple... Uh, a question there for you. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, what's up? 
A question was when running events, most of the airport ATIS are text only, and I can try my best to answer that one. I'm guessing the reason for that is recently there have been a number of technical glitches going on with the software we used to produce the ATIS, and it hasn't always been very good at connecting the voice. That seems to have been better the past few days. We always intend for there to be a voice ATIS, but there are times recently with the audio for Batson where it hasn't been working out as it should. Hopefully that's been mostly resolved. And the question about how to get ATIS, uh, so there's a question, can you repeat how to get the ATIS? And so the answer is you can either tune to the frequency, so that'll be what's published in your pilot client. You'll see KVOS underscore ATIS, and you'll be able to tune into the frequency. And then if you can't, or if you choose not to, you can also request that via text. There's a few different ways to do that depending on your pilot client. For example, in the vPilot client, you can type dot ATIS and then use the call sign, so KBOS underscore ATIS. Sometimes you can just double click on the ATIS. Sometimes you can right click on it. It depends on the pilot client and how you're doing it. And the instructions for your pilot client will explain how to get it via text. I always usually, when I was flying, would usually tune the frequency, but most airliners in real life are able to download the ATIS textually. So that's a good way to get it, especially if you're outside of the range. All right, a couple uh, don'ts for communication. Don't read back an instructor and you can't understand or proper, properly fly. This is a big thing on VATSIM. Uh, if, if you get assigned something, you get told, hey, fly the SOX 5 departure, and you have no idea how to do that, well, number one, attend our ground school later next month because we're going to talk about that. Uh, but number two, work with the controller and tell them, hey, we don't know how to fly the departure procedure. Uh, what would you like us to do? Uh, if you just read back, okay, we'll fly the departure, and then you start turning direct JFK, um, there's going to be a problem. So don't do that. Don't leave the controller's frequency until instructed to do so. This includes changing to another frequency or stepping up to go get chocolate cake out of the fridge. Uh, whatever the reason is, unless you have requested to step away, don't step away. Uh, don't contact a controller when instructed to monitor their frequency, right? We just talked about this, but the, the distinction is important. Uh, and lastly, over uh, don't over communicate on Unicom, CTAF, and advisory frequencies. You know, uh, I'm sure if you saw Alec flying in the Skyhawk, you'd be very excited and want to talk to him. But try not to have a, a conversation uh, over frequency because then nobody else is going to be able to transmit. Okay, we're going to move on to VFR radio communications. <clears throat> These differ between airport operations involving air traffic control and operations at uncontrolled airports. In general, VFR aircraft talks to air traffic control to gain permission for activities like access to airspace, using runways, takeoff and landing clearances, stuff like that, and to other aircraft to aid in visual responsibilities for VFR aircraft, also known as see and avoid. So I have a couple example um, uh, situations where you have uh, with and without ATC. So we're going to go ahead and run through some of them. Uh, Alec, would you rather be the controller or the pilot today? I will go ahead and uh, control today. So you go ahead and start off as the pilot. All right. So first, we're going to do a, a taxi and clearance example uh, with ATC. So at a, at a tower airport, Nantucket in this case. So, all right. We're sitting in our airplane. We're ready to taxi. Uh, Nantucket ground, Cessna 311, Bravo, Papa, FBO ramp, request taxi to the active. VFR to Bradley, 4,500, request flight following. Cessna 311, Papa Bravo, Nantucket, ground, runway 24, taxi via echo, departure frequency 118.2, squawk 1254. Okay, taxi to runway 24 via echo, departure frequency 118.2, squawk 1254, Cessna 311, Papa Bravo. I'll just point out a couple of quick things on that. The two underlying pieces of that initial contact phrase the pilot is advised where they are. That's really helpful for us. And that's especially true when we're talking about a, one of those top-down scenarios. So say Nantucket Ground is offline and you're calling Boston Center for a taxi instruction. If you call up with your initial call and say, Boston Center, I'm on the ground ready to taxi. I'm going to come back to you and say, I have like 70 controlled airports in my airspace. Which one are you at? So providing your location, if it's to Nantucket ground, then just where you are on the airport is important. And if you're talking to one of the overlying controllers, give us a little bit of a hint as to where you are. And the second piece of that that's underlined is the request for flight following. If you're looking for that type of service, advising us on the ground before you taxi helps us give you a transponder code and give you the departure frequency before you get going. And it allows us to do some coordination in the background. So if you're looking for flight following or radar service, please make that request early on. 
Also, we had a question from the chat from Joel. Do controllers listen to Unicom? The answer is not really right now. Every now and again, some people will try, but the way that the current audio for VATSIM set up is for controllers, we don't have an easy way of doing that. I've been told that there is some functionality in the pipeline that may change that in the future, and also there is some functionality that may allow for the use of guard, but as it stands, the guard frequency 21.5 is not to be used due to VATSIM policy, and controllers do not listen to Unicom 22.8 on a regular basis. It is possible for us to connect to the text, but very few of us will do that. All right. And uh, then over here on the right, we have a, a similar example for a taxi uh, clearance without ATC. So Concord traffic, Bonanza 376, Foxtrot Romeo, Hangar 3, taxi and runway 17, VFR closed traffic. Um, that's your your uh, a good example of a uh, taxi clearance at an untowered airport. Um, so you'd say Concord traffic. So this is the Concord airport. You're just advising traffic in that area. You're stating your aircraft type and identifier, Bonanza 376 Foxtrot Romeo, your location, Hangar 3, and what you're doing, taxing to runway 17. All right, quick question from uh, Google Meet. Isn't generally hard to say Concord traffic at the end of the transmission as well? Generally speaking, yeah, it, it, it's a good idea to also just mention Concord or the airport that you're calling. Um, at the end of an uncontrolled transmission as well. Another question, would you tune to 118.2 right after that second pilot communication? No, uh, because you're requesting ground uh, taxi from ground control. So ground, you'll taxi out with ground, they will switch you to uh, Nantucket Tower, and then uh, Nantucket Tower will clear you for takeoff, and then they say contact Boston departure. At that point is when you switch um, to 118.2. So as we said earlier, that's the F part of craft. So a couple different scenarios we have in play here. And as Alex said, in this example on the left side, the one where ATC is involved, 100% correct, that you'd be waiting for the ground controller to tell you, contact Nantucket Tower 118.2, or actually, in fact, sorry, it would be departure, like you said. Um, there's going to be a tower controller typically in there as well. So if you've gotten to the end of the runway, typically ground is going to say contact tower. Tower is going to give you a clear for takeoff. Then they'll say contact departure. There is a scenario where you may get to the end of the runway. If you haven't been told anything else by the ground controller, it is acceptable for you to just switch over to tower. And that's kind of the only time you'd really ever change frequencies without, in fact, checking. That being said, it's pretty rare. Most of us will always tell you when to switch to the next frequency. And as Alex said, we're absolutely not changing the departure on 118.2 at this point. They're just giving you that piece of information for later on. And then there was a second question on Google Meet, is this only if ATC is not online? So this is on the right-hand side without ATC. We're giving you examples of both scenarios. So the left side is going to be an example where you're departing with ATC involved, and the right side is going to be an example where you're simply using the CTAP or the Unicom to note your intentions. And that'll be consistent through a number of these example slides that we have. And then there's also a question from Alexis, VFR close traffic, what is that? Close traffic is a traffic pattern that VFR aircraft follow around a runway. That is what we will cover in ground school session number three in VFR procedures. So uh, the short answer, that's a runway pattern. Long answer, come to ground school number three. Some good advertising right there. And we will move on to the next scenario, which is a departure scenario. So let's uh, let's switch it up, Alec. You can be the the the... Cessna pilot on this one, and I will be our uh, air traffic controller waving my wands. Sounds good. <laughs> Nantucket Tower, Cessna 311, Papa Brava, holding short runway 24, VFR to the northwest, 4,500. Cessna 311, Bravo Papa, left cross when departure is approved, runway 24, clear for takeoff. Runway 24, uh, clear for takeoff, runway 24, left cross when departure, Cessna 311, Papa Bravo. And then in the uh, no air traffic control scenario, again, we're taking off from Concord, which is an uncontrolled airport. Concord traffic, Cessna 376, Foxtrot Romeo, departing runway 17, left close traffic, Concord. All right. Okay, I don't see any questions. We can move on. Arriving, so I'll be the air traffic controller this time, Creek, or if you want a pilot. Sure. So uh, the, the first example is when you're contacting approach to, to request a landing at, a, a in this case, a class Charlie Airport. Rally approach, Cessna 311 Bravo Papa, 4,500 information Juliet, inbound to Bradley, full stop. Cessna 311 Papa Bravo, Bradley approach, navigate to a left base runway 24, report the airport in sight. 
Hey, left base runway two four. Report the airport site number one. Bravo, Papa. Now, one one comment I'd I'd like to make on this is that actually, with the um that initial check in there, the the first lineup at the top, um the pilot actually should have provided a, a distance and a direction from the airport. So they should have said, hey, we're you know, 15 miles to the east of Bradley or something like that, but somewhere that gives ATC an indication of where they are relative to the airport. Yeah, absolutely right. And then without air traffic control, again, VFR traffic pattern will be covered in a later session, but Concord traffic Cessna 376 Foxtrot Romeo, seven miles west, planning to join left downwind runway 17, full stop Concord. And full stop here is referring to a full stop landing, not a low approach or a touch and go or something. Hey guys, uh, sorry, I had a question uh, on the departure here uh, right before. I don't mean to go back, but the reading back the whole departure pattern to the tower when you're holding short of the departure runway, for me, that kind of surprised me. It seems like I did not really pick that up on um, all the listening that I've done and the flying, the sim flying. You're supposed to not just say ready for departure runway four, you're supposed to can you go back to that just for a sec? So, uh, so can you clarify you're, your question? So you're referring to the portion here where it says VFR to the Northwest at 4,500? Yes, that, that level of specificity, I've just not been accustomed to hearing from other pilots uh, or even expecting, right? And that's going to be a big change for me. I used to just show up at the runway and say, hey, I'm ready for departure, and they let me off. Well, and, you know, this is one of those things where it, it depends a little bit. Um, if you had given that information to ground, uh, especially if you had received flight following, um, local or the tower controller rather should have that information as well. So this is something where in practice you could just check in and say, you know, Nantanga Tower, Mooney, 74 Victor holding short or runway 24 ready for departure. And, and they'll have that information and know what to do with it. Uh, it doesn't hurt to provide that information, uh, but if you've already given it to one of the controllers, they probably already have it. Yeah, for yeah. example, yeah. we can draw from two real-life examples at uh, one of the airports that I did a lot of my training at, Hanscom, which is uh, Bedford in Massachusetts. Uh, you don't tell ground your direction, so you just tell ground you're ready for taxi. You taxi, then you tell tower which way you're going. Contrast that to where I am now at Peachtree DeKalb Airport in Atlanta, PDK. You have to tell ground control uh, where you're going. They will tell tower, so tower will know where to send you and when to clear you for takeoff. And that's a good point that there is some some local variation to a lot of what we're talking about. If you fly in different regions or areas, you'll see slight variations in phraseology procedures and things like that. Super. Thank you for the comeback there for me. Sure. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I'm going to go back to this slide here and address a comment from, from Alan. So uh, when it says navigate to a left base, uh, that's essentially the, the telling the pilot, you know, you can do what you need to do as far as heading and altitude and speed. Uh, but get yourself onto a left base for, in this case, uh, it's, it's really just saying that that portion of navigation is the pilot's responsibility. Yeah, and a comment from Joel, is there a difference between saying Concord at the end and Concord traffic? No real difference, but Concord is more common. All right, let's keep going. All right. Uh, you're the, uh, the Cessna pilot again. Sure. Bradley Tower, Cessna 311, Papa Bravo, left base, runway 24. Uh, Cessna 311, Papa Bravo, Bradley Tower, runway 27, Clear to land runway 24, Cessna 311, Papa Bravo. All right. And then on the right. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, without ATC and you're making those those calls on the Unicom or the CTAF, Concord Traffic, Cessna 376, Foxtrot, Romeo, short final runway 17, full stop, Concord. All right. Any difference between short final and final? Not really. Uh, short final is just when you're real close to the runway and you really want to make sure nobody does uh, takes the runway before you. Final is just the same thing. Not too much of a difference between the two. Yeah. Yeah, 
Yeah, so some of this is, is I, I don't think, oh, yes, that's right. That's right. Thank you. So the, the question was essentially, is there a definition of short final? And what does that mean when somebody says short final? Uh, and that's a really good question. Thank you, Simon. Um, I don't think there is a, a legal definition as far as, you know, a FAR or, or uh, something in the AIM or anything like that. Um, it really is up to somewhat up to interpretation. But like Alex said, it means you're, you're in the imminent state phases of, of landing uh, or landing is imminent. Rather, I'm sorry, English is not my strong suit, clearly. But you're, you're very close to landing. For me, I interpret that as less than a mile final. Um, and Alec, you can feel free to contribute if, if you don't agree with any of that. Um, I agree with that completely. It's either a mile final or if they're quite out, if they're a little farther out. Any other questions while we're here? Okay. Uh, so uh, VFR in the after landing scenario. So uh, this would be when you're calling uh, the ground control after you've exited the runway. Rally ground, November 311, Papa Bravo on taxi UA Echo. Request taxi to the signature FBO. I think Alec may have uh, lost connection. He mentioned earlier that he was having a thunderstorm pass through, so there's a good chance that uh, something with that has impacted. I can take over that part of the communication. So ATC's response, number 311, Papa Bravo, Bradley Ground, taxi to the ramp via Echo. Taxi to ramp via Echo, November 311, Papa Bravo. Um, yeah, and Alec did just text me and say he lost power, so I guess you guys are stuck with me for a little bit. I'm sorry for your loss. Yes. Okay, that's fine. Uh, we will work around it. Like the yeah, we'll work around it. Um, and then without ATC, you um, uh, just say conquer traffic. Cessna three seven six Fox Charter is clear runway one seven, and then you can go. Taxi in and, and do your thing. Uh, question from Nick. Uh, Nick asks, can you clear the runway as early as possible if not explicitly directed? Yeah, so the, the expectation is that you're going to land safely, break normally, get to a safe speed, and then take the first available exit. If you decide to taxi down the entire length of a 12,000-foot runway without saying anything, you're probably going to get chewed out for it. If, uh, let's say, you're landing on, on a runway and the um, the FBO is all the way at the other end of the runway, like you're going to Farmingdale, New York, or something like that, um, you can request a long landing. And when you check in with a tower, say, you know, hey, Mooney, 7-4, Victor, we're going to uh, signature FBO. Can we get a long or request a long landing? And um, they may approve that. But unless they tell you that you can land long, the expectation is that you will take the first available taxiway that you can make safely. And it's as also important said, to know that you shouldn't, um, sorry, Evan, you shouldn't exit on a runway unless you are explicitly authorized to. So be yes. that in the ATIS at Boston, where the ATIS will say uh, runway 33 three, uh, left is, or runway 33 three right is approved for uh, runway exit, or air traffic control says exit left on runway 33 three right, you should not exit onto another runway unless you're explicitly authorized to. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. And that's something you can also request. There was an airport I used to operate into regularly where we always wanted to exit off onto the crossing runway because it was a short taxi in. So we just make that request when we checked on with the tower or five miles out of the ILS requesting to exit on runway 36. And again, that's something that can be approved before you actually land. And of course, ATC can always authorize you to exit onto runway. But unless you've gotten that authorization, as Krikor said, normal braking, exit onto the first available taxiway, commensurate with safety. Sorry. All right. We'll keep it rolling along. 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 Sorry. Uh, IFR radio communications. So IFR pilots uh, compared to VFR pilots are normally in contact with air traffic control the entire flight. Uh, in fact, that's a very large part of the process. Uh, IFR pilots are typically reading back ATC instructions the entire flight. The, um, there are certain exempt, or exemptions to that, rather, which we'll talk about in a minute. But for almost the entire flight, you're talking ATC, you're reading back instructions. Um, most of the time, those instructions will need to be read back in full, so not a lot of shortcutting or things you can leave out, and you need to put your call sign, like we talked about, especially for altitudes and hold short instructions. Um, 
there are some examples of when uh, IFR pilots need to be familiar with uncontrolled airport operations. So for example, if you're landing at an untowered airport, such as Provincetown or KPVC, uh, Papa Victor Charlie, uh, on an IFR flight plan, um, there's going to be a point where you will need to fly in an uncontrolled environment when you come in to land. Um, at the same time on VATSIM, specifically landing at a controlled airport when air traffic control is unavailable is important. So we may be operating um, yeah, on, on, under IFR, you know, instrument flight rules on VATSIM, but there's no, no Boston Center online. Um, in general, IFR communications at uncontrolled airports are similar to VFR calls. Uh, people on VATSIM, from my experience, tend to make long, drawn-out calls that are uh, a little bit unnecessary. Because that um, never happens in real life? Yeah. And, and well, this is true as well. But even when, you know, if you're coming into Boston, let's say, and you're, you're crossing um, MILT, which is the, the final approach fix on the ILS-4 right into Boston, um, this is even a real life example. Don't go on CTAF and say, Boston traffic, American 1234 is crossing MILT ILS runway 4 right. Most pilots are not going to know where MILT is. And so even in the real world, a lot of uncontrolled IFR communications will get broken down um, almost to be the same as VFR communication. So in that scenario, you'd say Boston traffic, American 1234 is on a five mile final runway four, right? Just something that's plain English and it's easy for people to understand. I've heard as well, pilots just using a description of the airplane, right? Who cares about your call sign? So it could be American Boeing 737 or it could be white Cessna 172. I've heard those kinds of calls in the untowered environment in real life. Yeah, you, you hear that a lot. Uh, the FAA put out an advisory circular a year or two ago, specifically addressing traffic pattern operations at Untowered Airport and discouraged that practice. They they want you to, to use your full tail number, although you still hear it all the time anyway. Yeah, and I guess that makes sense as far as allowing somebody to respond to you. It might be a little easier if you've got your call sign involved. And I suppose there might be something, some legality of if it was recorded, they at least know who it is. Yeah, I think that's a lot of what plays into it. Any questions about any of this stuff so far? Alrighty. So uh, here are some example IFR clearances. Uh, let me just see. Yeah. So Evan, do you want to do these or do you want me to do them? I'm happy to, or Alec, Alec can whatever you guys want. Yeah, I can yeah, jump in to do these, uh, hoping the power doesn't go out again. Yeah, well, uh, why don't you be the airplane, Alec, and I'll be the uh, the controller. Okay. And uh, Boston Clearance, Southwest 1673, requesting IFR to Portland. Southwest 1673, Boston Clearance, clear to the Portland jet port via the Logan 2 departure. Radar vectors, P's, then as filed. Maintain 5,000. Departure frequency is 133.0, squawk 2452. Clear to the Portland jet port via the Logan 2 departure, radar vectors, Portsmouth, then as filed. Maintain 5,000. Departure, or I'm sorry, squawk 2452, Southwest 1673. Southwest 1673, read back correct. And the reason we have departure frequency 133.0 in there in uh, parentheses is because on VATSIM, we don't always have a departure frequency. Sometimes the controller is offline and the departure is on CTAF for common traffic advisory frequency. In the real world, you always would have a departure frequency. And of course, also the departure frequency is sometimes not specified if it's published on the chart. And that's one of the biggest things that we have done here at this ARTCC that I know not all our techs do. If something is available on the chart, we may not necessarily provide it to you. And that's very consistent with real world practice. Similarly, using this example, and we'll see this in a few minutes, when this aircraft departs, the only phrase the tower is going to say is contact departure. You're not going to hear the frequency when you're told to switch from tower to departure because we've already given it to you as part of the clearance and it's published on the Logan 2. So for that reason, it's really important to note that departure frequency now. The FAA is very strict on us as controllers or virtual controllers that we're not supposed to give you a piece of information like a frequency right as you're trying to raise the landing gear and deal with a complex departure. The idea is we've given you that before, you've preloaded it into your radio, and when we say contact departure, all you're doing is flipping the switch from standby to active. We are not supposed to give you that information after departure, and that's why it's included here. So it's important that we're writing that information down or putting that into the standby radio somewhere. And a lot of people, operators generally, will sell, will tell their pilots, put that departure frequency somewhere 
in your backup, whether it's the standby of your COM2 or whether it's your standby for COM1. There's different practices that have been involved, but usually people will have some means of having that frequency there. And then it's just a matter of flicking the switch from standby to active when you're told to contact departure. Yeah, lots of different uh, methods we can use to mitigate pilot workload. And Nick, you asked a question there. I, I didn't entirely get uh, what you're going after. Uh, however, you'll, you'll notice that some so components, right, like the departure, departure frequency, frequency and the squat code, code and stuff are the same as a VFR, VFR clearance. Uh, it, it, uh, it does, does follow some, some of the same model, same model uh, if you are requesting flight, flight following, flight but uh, there's a lot more information. You wouldn't have a clearance limit, uh, a route portion, or, or an altitude. Well, you may have an altitude portion, uh, but it would be a little bit different if it was a, a VFR clearance for flight following. I think it was the flight following that uh, kind of threw me off and made it similar. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Also a question of whether the departure frequency should be read back. And we had this discussion not that long ago and we all tried to find it. And maybe Creek or Alec know something I don't, but we couldn't find anywhere in the AIM or the 7110, which is the air traffic control version of the AIM, that specifically says whether or not you have to read back a full clearance. There's support for simply reading back your call sign in this example. My practice and my recommendation is that you read back everything because the read back is your opportunity as a pilot to make sure that you've got it right. And it's our opportunity as a controller to check your understanding. So if you don't read it back and you misheard me say 135.0, that opportunity to catch the error goes away. So my recommendation and I think the practice of most airlines, professional pilots out there is to read back every instruction pretty much verbatim and then allow the controller to correct if there's an error. But as I say, I'm not aware of any specific requirement to do that. Creek or Alec, you can correct me if I'm wrong. No, I haven't. I'm, I don't know I'm of any either. Um, I know that looking through the 65 recently, I heard that a tech, uh, a Roger is an acceptable readback. Uh, not that any controller would ever accept that, but there's no clear definition. When in doubt, read everything back. Yeah. All right, moving on. IFR taxi clearance. Uh, Alec, you want to switch roles again? Yep. All right. Pulse to ground, Delta 8011, information, Bravo, uh, signature, request taxi. So here, what does information Bravo actually refer to? What do you guys think? Yeah, a couple guys in Google Meet got it. It's the ATIS. Uh, you always want to call in with that when you are calling for taxi. Delta 811, Boston ground, runway 22 right, taxi via Alpha, November, cross, runway 15 right, hold short, runway 15 left. So what part of this does the pilot have to read back? So you have to read back the, honestly, I would probably read back all of it, uh, but you definitely have to read back the hold short. That's, that's, that's what air traffic control is really looking for. Hold short in their call sign. Runway assignments as well, there's support, as uh, someone mentioned, there is support in the AIM in the 7110 to say that a runway assignment is a required readback. Certainly uh, tax instruction would be a good idea. And like Alex said, I would be reading back the whole thing. Read back all of it is a long story short. Yeah. All right. Runway two two right. Taxi by Alpha November cross. Runway one five right. Hold short. Runway one five left. Delta eighty eleven. So the oh, there was a quick question. Would you hold short of runway one five right? Uh, well, this clearance explicitly says cross runway one five right. So no, you would not. In this case, you would cross runway one five right and hold short runway one five left. And if you were unsure, a good practice, of course, would be to stop and ask the question. But 100%, uh, if you've if you've read this instruction back and you understand it says cross runway one five right, absolutely you go across. As a as I say, if you were unsure of that, you get there and you say, hi, I can't remember if they gave me that clearance or not. Absolutely no harm in saying, I'm sorry, Delta eighty eleven. Just want to clarify where we cleared to cross runway one five right. Yeah, and questions like this that quote unquote aren't standard, you can use plain English like, hey, uh, ground. I'm sorry, Delta eighty eleven. Are were we cleared to cross runway one five right? Works perfectly. Yeah, and the more you know, plain language is a great example when you're trying to clarify something because if you come back with, you know, Delta eighty eleven holding short of runway one five right. I don't really understand why you're saying that to me because I'm thinking as the controller, well, I cleared you to cross runway 15 right, and I'm not understanding why you're asking that question. So the answer that you get from me may be a little bit different than what you want. Whereas if you say it the way that Alec just did, I can go, yeah, no worries. 
you were previously instructed, cross German 1-5 right at November, hold short of 1-5 left. And now we are all on the exact same page as to what you're supposed to do and what you're wondering about in the first place. Sure, no problem. All right. Uh, I have for departure. We'll, we'll uh, continue role-playing here and swap it around again. So, uh, Alec, you can be the... Uh, yeah. Uh, wait, is that me uh, or you? No, I'll just confused. take air traffic control. Right. Southwest 1673, uh, monitor Boston Tower, 128.8. All right, monitor Boston Tower, 128.8, Southwest 1673. All right, ladies and gents, who speaks next, controller or pilot? Yep, controller it is because it was a monitor instruction. Southwest 1673, Boston Tower, runway 22 right, cleared for takeoff. Clear take off to to right southwest sixteen seventy three, and once he's in the air, southwest sixteen seventy three contact departure. So how come I didn't give southwest sixteen seventy three a frequency for departure? He already had it. What does that mean? Yep, it's on the chart, or it was given in the IFR clearance, or both. Good thing I talked about this earlier, huh? <laughs> contact departure southwest sixteen seventy three. And now once we get to the approach, Creek War will be the controller and I'll be the pilot. Portland approach, Southwest 1673, descending through flight level 190 for 11,000 information, Juliet. Now, I'm actually going to point something out here that we probably should have corrected previously. Um, this is an example of something that while it's not uh, like legally incorrect, it is not good practice to use four in the middle there where it says fly level 190 411000. Uh, it's just a uh, generally speaking, not a great idea to use something that could be easily mistaken for a number. So ideally you would check in and say Southwest 1673 flight level 190 descending 11000. Uh, so just a, a quick comment there. Yeah, absolutely right. I was going to say the same thing. Don't use four when you're talking about altitudes because you might confuse that for a number four. Southwest 1673, Portland approach. Expect vectors, ILS runway 29er approach. Altimeters 3012. And let's say I don't want to fly the ILS approach. Southwest 1673, we're requesting harbor visual runway 29er approach. Southwest 1673, expect the harbor visual runway 29er approach. Southwest 1673, we'll expect the harbor visual runway 29er approach. All right, and we'll continue for the uh, the landing. Oh, yep. Yeah. All right, Alec, continue. Portland Tower, Southwest 1673, passing House Island, or Harbor Visual, runway 29 or approach. Southwest 6... Oh, so I got to click there. Southwest 1673, Portland Tower, wind 230 at 6, runway 29 or clear to land. Clear to land, runway 29 or Southwest 1673. And Portland Ground, Southwest 1673 on Alpha, request taxi to gate 3. So why did I inform the controller of the gate? Anyone? Please, one at a time, please. Yeah, exactly right. I need to tell the controller where I'm actually going because it's a big airport. And especially at larger airports where there could be multiple terminals or entries into the ramp, it, it could be really important. That's probably what they would assume. It never hurts to clarify. Um, but that's, that's likely where they're going to assume you're going like at Portland. Well, Portland has two. So that's a bad example. Actually at, at Boston, they would assume you were going up to signature. But then again, it's never a good idea to assume, uh, cause we all know what, uh, the mnemonic is about assume. Um, so always good to clarify. All right. Southwest 1673, Portland Ground, taxi to the ramp via Alpha. Southwest 
Taxi to Alpha, uh, Taxi V Alpha to the ramp, Southwest 1673. All righty. Um, All right. That about covers it. Evan, if you want to continue that discussion you had started on text. Yeah, absolutely. So for those two questions that we were just talking about in text, we can take that off and team speak here as soon as the recording is done. Thank you very much to Alec and Krikor for dedicating an hour and of course all the prep time to make this session happen. And for those of you who have participated both here in team speak and as well joining us from VATSIM and VATUSA on the Google Meet. We'll see you again next week, Wednesday at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. We'll be talking about weather. And until then, wish you guys blue skies, happy flying. And just before we close off tonight, for anyone who's interested in some surveillance or radar approaches, we have a little fun going on tomorrow night at Bangor. We'll have a controller staffed up to do some radar approaches. So have a look at our forums. I posted a couple of days ago a link to how that's going to work and what you need to do to take part. Obviously, with the way that those approaches work, we won't be able to accommodate more than probably five or six over the course of the night. But people who are interested in listening or participating, I'm including the link in the bottom of TeamSpeak. Thanks again, everyone, for participating. And for those who'd like to stick around and ask some questions as soon as the recording is done, by all means, feel free to do that. And of course, you're all always welcome to email us if you guys have any questions. We're always available. Well, that's